Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, saving the World Bank from itself, I wish I had thought of that for the <laughs> session title. Um, okay, we will now take uh, questions and we'll follow a time-honored Williams tradition by giving uh, priority to students. And uh, if you have a question, if there's somebody that you want to address it to, uh, please identify them, or uh, if it's for the entire panel, you can say so as well. Yes, please. Um, Yes, on this panel, on the, on, on the World Bank. So you're saving that for tomorrow. Okay. Yes, please. You want to try that? Yeah. On the later question, I think we are still learning about the consequences of the global financial crisis. And there is no big shift as far as the thinking on the intellectual underpinnings is concerned. So I'm not quite sure whether there is some serious work being done in the academic world about the, are we going to have another Keynes or Milton Friedman or Hayek or somebody who really wants to show us the direction? I don't know that. I'm just, China, India, Pakistan had cautious liberalization. In a paper which I did uh, for the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, I showed that the China has had actually taken corrective measures well before the 2007-2008 crisis. They had hived off all their non-performing loans to the asset management companies which were financed by the treasury, by the finance. And by the time the crisis came in, the balance sheets of the big four banks in China were pretty clean. So there was a lot of regulatory, supervisory uh, oversight over the banks and proactive stance. India and Pakistan also did not allow, you know, exotic uh, products like the derivatives to just take off. Uh, there was some requirements for them to meet. Therefore, they were pretty much saved uh, from all the collateral debt obligations, which uh, many other countries didn't do. So I think we have to see the impact of regulation and supervision in these countries vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., where, you know, six agencies, the SEC, the FDIC, the OCC, the Fed Reserve, the Superintendent of Banking, everybody's fighting with each other and nobody's really getting uh, the act done. And that, I think, is, is an issue which needs to be examined as far as the global financial crisis is concerned. On the first question, as far as I know, there, the bank has very strict uh, audit uh, and procurement rules. And by and large, I would submit that with some exceptions where uh, 
malfeasance has happened. The, the bank money is actually going to the right projects or the right places. It doesn't mean that corruption does not take place, but there are black listing of the agents of the companies by the bank which acts as a deterrent but in all human endeavors you know you don't have a hundred percent perfect record well, sure yeah. um, on this issue of tracking the money I just <coughs> wanted to say it's a little more radical than what Ishrat said in a sense you know the bank and all the other donors do track the money but there are two issues one is that well, some of the money is fungible, so, you know, as uh, some great economist whose name escapes me now said, the money that you lend for the health system could be paying indirectly for the jet of the head of state uh, because it goes into the budget, and if you're paying for something from outside that a country would have done anyway, can spend different money on what it wants to do. So that's one issue, but more fundamental is that the, the view now in many quarters is that the bank, say, can make sure there's no corruption and they, they audit carefully. The 2% of all spending that is bank financed, but what about the 98% that's financed from the budget? So now the bank has developed a new lending instrument, which I like a lot, although I'm not sure it will be well exploited, which says, let's pay for results, or let's pay for some measure of actual outcomes. Did the road get built? You know, did the children learn something in school? Um, because what's the point of tracking money then if it's not, if it's fungible and it's not necessarily accomplishing anything? Okay, other questions? Yes, please. Could you, could you, yeah, uh, just say, say, summarize your question. There are parts of your question voice. that were disappearing there. Yeah, well, I, so. Uh, you don't. You you hope that they um, <laughs> sort of join you hope the that club. They do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the idea is the fundamental idea is that as development becomes more of a shared mission, you know, we, uh, one of the things that Ishrat mentioned is that the there's a billion people living in countries that are middle income countries. So poverty reduction in those countries is going to be more and more a question of national and domestic policies, right? Um, independent of what outsiders have to say about it. If it ever mattered what outsiders said, it's, it matters even less now. So the, the challenge of inequality is going to be very fundamental uh, in these middle income countries where there's still very many poor people living. The same at the global level with global public goods. Until China and India in particular, which have the potential to contribute hugely, even in terms of research um, and in terms of their own domestic decisions about a low carbon growth path or not, until they're engaged in the larger discussion and contributing, I don't see that, there's, that it's going to work that we will, we, we will continue to have an undersupply. So the concept is get them engaged because they'll be taking the lead and in charge, just as uh, at Bretton Woods in 1946, the US and the Europeans took charge. 
And use it as a way to finesse the problems that Robert was talking and about. And use it as a way to finesse those problems. Right. It also could save the World Bank because then they would have more of a commitment to the World Bank and more interest. I mean, I don't want to go on and on, but one of the puzzles, or not a puzzle, is why wasn't there more resistance uh, at the appointment of the recent uh, president to the uh, push again for the U.S.? to ensure that its own candidate became the president. There was some, but there wasn't really that much. So it, it's easy for the Chinese and the Koreans now to say, look, enough already, you know, it doesn't matter to us. We don't need the resources. Uh, that's the risk, even on the IMF, they set up Chiang Mai and so they're disengaged and then we lose the benefits of a multilateral system. Okay, can I just? Please. Just a, a quick, point from the inside about um, the case of the U.S. getting its way with the presidency and, and appointing a U.S. citizen again, despite um, a chorus of uh, statements over the past few years that these positions, the head of the World Bank, head of IMF and others should be not restricted by nationality. Um, and the point that I'm the story that I'm going to tell, a uh, very brief story, makes the point that uh, one of the fundamental problems is that the developing countries have profound distrust, distrust of each other and find it very difficult to act concertedly. So in this case, um, the board of the bank was due to vote on who to appoint as president because formally it has to be uh, voted on and two days before the board vote the G11 that's the group of 11 executive directors at the World Bank who represent developing countries they met uh, and they discussed the forthcoming vote for several hours and then they conducted an unofficial ballot and uh, at that time there were still three candidates there was Dr. Kim the American candidate there was Ngozi from Nigeria, Nigerian finance minister, and there was Ocampo from uh, Colombia, former finance minister of Colombia. And the unofficial ballot produced um, 10 votes for Ngozi and one for Ocampo from the Brazilian executive director. But the Brazilian director, uh, executive director then announced that he would telephone Ocampo and ask him to withdraw, which Ocampo did so that there were then only two candidates, Ngozi from Nigeria and Kim from the United States. And the vote then was 11 for Ngozi and zero for Kim. That was two days before the board meeting. Over those two days, the US Treasury really began to man the telephones and made the deals with the capitals, which ensured that by the time of the board vote, only three of the 25 executive directors voted for Ngozi. They were all the three Africans, and all the others, including those who two days before had said they would vote for Ngozi, had switched in the meantime to Kim. Uh, so, and, and one of the ways that this was achieved was by offering senior appointments to key countries, so that, for example, in August, just a few weeks ago, um, it was announced that a Chinese national would head the IFC, International Finance Corporation. That position as, of head of the International Finance Corporation has always been held by a Euro European until now. So this is the first time that a non-European has held it, and it is being uh, held now by China. That was part of the, that was an example of the kind of deals that were struck in order to persuade all these executive directors uh, to vote, to switch the, their votes in favor of Dr. Kim. That's how global politics works. Okay, thanks. Back there? Yeah, please. Either one of you, I think. Uh, I think that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 
Yes, I think that's, that's right. Uh, I think to some extent it's already happening. Um, and, but it, it's complicated, you know, like so many things. One thing that's interesting about the regional banks um, is that they, they differ amongst themselves too. Uh, the, the president of the Asian bank is, is really sort of locked in as a Japanese. Whereas at the Inter-American Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the, the regions, the members of the region um, vote. And that actually provides for a little bit more protection of what I would call minority rights. Gives minority countries and mm -hmm. small countries a veto. So there's variations and it, 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 all of those things matter. But there is no question, I agree completely with, I think it was Ishrat who said, there's a greater sense of ownership uh, in the smaller banks. But the, and they could be doing more regional public goods, but I think the World Bank really is the one that has a comparative advantage in working on global public goods. Okay. We had another question back there, yes. <laughs> yeah, of course, it's, it, um, it is a great question, but the, I mean, the basic point is that um, if developing countries had a substantially larger share, then, it, for example, in the run-up uh, after the um, uh, East Asian crisis, it would have been much more difficult for um, the World Bank and other organizations to insist that the cause of the East Asian crisis um, was to do with uh, governance deficiencies in the crisis-affected countries, and it had nothing to do, I'm exaggerating, but it, basically it had nothing to do with the fact that these countries had opened their capital account. They um, were strongly encouraged to adopt the strategy of economic growth with foreign borrowing, so foreign capital flooded in, and then very suddenly it equally uh, flooded out, uh, causing a, the collapse. It seems to me you cannot understand what happened in East Asia without um, reference to the weaknesses of international re regimes, such as on capital flows, such as on exchange rates. But these organizations, being dominated by the advanced countries, um, absolutely didn't want to focus attention on those kind of problems. They wanted to focus attention on the fact that the Suharto government was up to its eyeballs in corruption and similarly the, uh, the government in Korea and so on and so on. That was where the focus of attention was. If the developing, developing countries had had a substantially larger voice, then they, it's more likely that there would have been over these past uh, two, one or two decades more attention paid on the way in which um, policies and institutions in the advanced countries, notably the United States, have um, uh, helped to generate rising financial fragility in the world economy. They haven't done that. Um, the IMF has no discipline over the uh, advanced countries. It can only uh, really discipline the, the middle-sized uh, middle and poor uh, developing countries. So there could have been a difference if the in what they said by way of diagnosis and prescription if the distribution of power within them had been different. Uh, I think Robert set up the panel tomorrow morning on global financial architecture extremely well with that comment. Uh, we only have time for one more brief question before we break. So uh, is there, are there any more students? Please. The bubbles. Concerning the what? ODA. Yeah. ODA. Yeah.
Right. This, this is the idea. Yeah, the idea. The country is yeah. moving out. Oh. Yeah, the, the basis um, is, I may not get it exactly right, it's in the paper that I drew those pictures from, but it's basically using our IMF projections through 2015, and then uh, some, and probably constant returns to scale, production and production function, <laughs> you know, some convergence. It's um, probably pretty reasonable. Um, it's going through 2025 or even 2030. So, if anything, I, my guess is that my colleagues tried to be conservative so that, it, the, the, you know, someone wouldn't say, well, you exaggerated the rate of growth in these countries so that they'd grow out of IDA eligibility more quickly. My guess is that they were conservative, but my guess is they also, by using, starting as a base from IMF projections through 2015, they would be reflecting recent progress in countries, particularly in Africa, which was mentioned, that there has been a marked uh, increase in rates of growth of many countries in Africa. At least 20 have been at 5% or more a year for the last five, six, seven years. Does that address your question? So I could refer you to the source. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, with that, I'm going to have to draw this panel to uh, a close. Um, we're going to resume here uh, at 8 o'clock when Professor uh, James Robinson from Harvard is going to speak on his book, Why Nations Fail. Um, those who are on the agenda and with an invitation, uh, there's a dinner next door at the, uh, at the faculty club that begins at, uh, at 6. Uh, and please join me in thanking our panelists for stimulating discussion. <laughs>